Christmas uh, 2019, we visited Myanmar. We'd hesitated to visit the place because of the uh, generals that used to run it and still seem to despite elections, though we didn't see any signs of the military anywhere. Our first stop was Yangon, previously named Rangoon by the British, which was explained to us as a misinterpretation of the Burmese writing, where R becomes a Y and a O becomes an O or vice versa. Anyway, the name Myanmar was a more ancient name of the region and less racially charged, apparently, as there are quite a lot of other racial groups here, such as the Bama, the Mon and the Shan. This is the Independence Monument in Yangon. They received independence in 1948. The president was going to be General Ansan. Ansan Su Chi's father, but he and most of the cabinet were assassinated. In this room, in fact. This is the secretariat. They're um, renovating it at the moment and tried to turn it into a shrine to the martyrs. The conspirators were hanged and an elected government took over, but uh, they never really recovered from the blow. The various states making up the Burmese Federation had the right to secede and apparently the Shan were all too willing to do so. And so General Nguyen took over uh, to save the nation. And after having a dream, he ordered everyone to uh, drive on the right-hand side of the road. And given that most of the cars are still left-hand driving cars, it adds an extra bit of excitement crossing the roads. Most of the buildings you're seeing were built in the 1930s and 1940s, though the National Court House here was built in 1900. Yangon was a very large and impressive colonial city, but it is the temples that now truly impress. The Bota Town Temple was originally built 2,500 years ago. Though so today's was actually built in 1948 because in 1943 the RAF bombed it while Japan was in control. It supposedly holds a sacred hair of the Buddha. No doubt the reason for him going bald. The Shwedagon Pagoda houses relics of four Buddhas, a staff, a water filter, a piece of rope, and eight strands of Gautama Buddha's hair. These were brought to Burma by a couple of brothers who'd met Gautama. Supposedly built upon the oldest stupa in the world at 2,600 years of age, and over the years it's been repaired and rebuilt several times. The present version is the result of rebuilding after an earthquake in 1768. The British used the place as a military base from 1852 to 1929 and it has been a focal point of protests from the independence movement of 1946 to the democracy campaign of 2007. As you can see, they take Buddhism seriously here. You can get thrown into jail using Buddhist symbols in advertisements or tattoos. And it seems everyone gets a period in a monastery. Come school holidays, parents love to send their kids off to the monasteries to get a haircut and be taught the main rules of Buddhism. Which are basically that life's a pain and if you cock it up, you uh, have to come back as a cockroach or some other lowly creature and work your way up again.
right up the top there, but no one can really appreciate it. <laughs> the face paint that you see on most of the women and quite a few of the men is Tanaka. It is made from the Tanaka tree. You just grind up the wood and the bark and so on with some water and uh, spread it on your face. It's used as a protection from the sun and is generally thought to be a tonic for the skin. It's very good for acne, I'm told. Bogan grew up while the Saxons and Vikings were fighting it out over who should run England. There are 3,822 temples here, built between the 9th and 13th century for a population of about 200,000 people at its peak as capital of the Pagan Empire, controlled by Barmahas. The place declined during the period of the Mongol invasions. It remained a place of pilgrimage though, and was restored between 1752 to 1885. Western archaeologists also added to its troubles by removing various chunks of murals to send home to various museums. The Ananda Temple, built in 1105, is particularly impressive. This was built long before the Renaissance in Europe and was definitely built to last, with some very solid walls. The architects were killed or buried alive by the kings so that they could become guardians of the temple and of course not build another for some other competing king. They didn't go much on non-compete clauses in the contracts those days. The Irrawaddy River here used to be the main highway throughout Burma and one can still take a slow ferry up the river to Mandalay. But today we simply went out for the sunset. No trip to Bagan is complete without a hot air balloon ride. The balloon Lumley has no steering, unless you call up and down steering, and essentially they go wherever the wind blows and come down wherever they can. But they are much smoother than an aeroplane and you get to see an awful lot more.
where you climbed in, use your footholds, take your time. If you need help, wait for someone to help you. It has to be said that the Burmese do like to make an awful lot of noise when they decide that music is required. Here we have a rather raucous parade in honour of a bunch of youngsters reaching a good enough age to be packed off to a monastery for a bit of religious discipline. Most of them only stay for a few days or weeks. And it's a bit of a coming of age, come confirmation, come bar mitzvah celebration. Elephants the better. Though I'm not sure what the guys with the moustaches and umbrellas are all about, but I'm told that for Burmese they are hilarious and somehow lampoon characters who are, let's say, a bit full of themselves. Why? I've no idea. And nobody could tell me. We were told that the reason for so many children of different ages was because this would be a wealthy family celebration laid on for their children, but to gain extra merit, they would have paid for a ceremony to include the children of the whole district, most of whom would not actually be heading off to the monastery that day, or had actually already had their taste of monastic life, which seems to have been a bit of a summer camp experience for most. The local market is always a good way of people watching. For me, it is strangely reminiscent of some of the street markets one used to find in London circa 1960. If I recall, headscarves and heavy duty makeup were also the order of the day. It made me wonder whether Burma was actually entering into the same sort of opening up of society that uh, post war Britain experienced. But then there's probably me just getting all groovy and nostalgic for swinging London. Fresh and yeah. Even in the market in Bagan, it's different. We oh. just we don't have the yellow color, just the normal skin. Like right? this before here, they like the yellow color. The shop where they sell the beetle. Oh. Yeah. Oh, so make, yeah. She has all the ingredients inside. It like, depends on the customer. She can make different tastes, like yeah. Indian taste, Burmese taste, like this. More stronger, less strong. Yeah. The people came and buy. The one who chew, they came and buy here. It smells nice. Yes. <laughs> And you should make a little package in the hands. Yeah. The white things are the uh, slate lime. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. And the brown paste are tobacco paste. And now she's putting the nuts. So which bit of all this gives the red? And uh, the red one is the green yeah. leaf and this nut. Yeah. And when you chew it together, so you get the yeah. When you chew it together, it makes the red. So how, how much is one of those? They are very cheap. Uh, they are very cheap. 
Uh, it could be only like one for a hundred. Okay. Yeah. Does she eat this herself? She also eat. I find it to wala go ya. Uh, yeah, she chose a little bit only. Oh. Yeah. When she started to getting ready for the shop, yeah. she turned yeah. in the morning. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, she cannot eat very strong one. <laughs> so how many does she sell a day? Uh, how many packages? Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. 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 Wait, Oh, so uh, after 12.30, she go back home. Oh, okay. <laughs> ah. <laughs> yeah, I do that too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Naturally, I had to try some. Uh, I knew it as pan, and the taste is not unpleasant, and uh, it reminded me somewhat of the old fisherman's friend sweet that you'd buy at a tobacconist to ward off smoker's cough. Uh, the beetle nut component is supposed to be chewed, which is probably why so many people had broken teeth. The nut is as hard as a walnut shell and just as malleable. The supposed narcotic effect didn't hit me. And frankly, I doubt it could ever replace a good gin and tonic. This monastery was noted for being made of wood and was only for the second tier monk. Hence, only two staircases, three being reserved for the more important monks, which would probably make the guys who live up here probably either the most enlightened or the fittest. What was I saying about a gin and tonic? Well, actually, the local tipple was rum sour. This seems to have been a thing for cocktails in Burma. They made rum locally and the villagers seemed to, well, have various stills for brewing all manner of alcohols. And what's not to like about mixing a bit of fruit and sugar with it just to make it palatable. Well, this is the nearest we could get to a bit of Christmas bling. I looked for a turkey dinner, but uh, I didn't hold out much hope.
In May Lake is in the Shan area. At one time this was a forbidden zone as it was run by its own ruling body with its own army. Uh, they've made their peace now with the Burmese Federation which is just as well because it has now become a great tourist attraction bringing in a lot of money. Though it's still a land of subsistence fishermen and farmers Uniquely, they create floating farms on the lake, growing such things as tomatoes. And the rowing style of the fishermen provides lots of photo opportunities. Although you'll see a real mix of ethnicities here, the Shan themselves came to the region with the Mongols and stayed. Which might be a bit why I keep thinking that the Burmese dialects all sound a bit Chinese to me. There is a lot of Chinese influence in the region. In fact, the Kuomintang fleeing from the communists set up their own state here, much to the annoyance of the British. The area has long been the haunt of various warlords making a living out of the opium trade. Though I didn't see any of that. I did see plenty of cheroots being smoked though. Actually, I had to have a go. They have many flavoured varieties which uh, gives the smoke a not unpleasant flavour, though what smoke in the various pieces of perfumed wood chips added to the mix does for your lungs doesn't really bear too much thinking about. One of the specialities here is weaving cloth made out of threads made from water lilies. This woman is pulling the strands out of the stalks. You have to pull up a lot of water lilies to make a shirt.
life here might not be full of all the home comforts, but uh, you'll see everyone has a phone of some sort and uh, TV sets and even Wi-Fi in places. And the food is most definitely organic and as fresh as you could imagine. Though one suspects the diesel fumes and the noise from the engines is the most unhealthy aspect of their lives. If you do have money here, this is what you spend it on. You make sure that your children are kings for at least one day in their life. This is another one of those coming of age ceremonies where they pack the young dude off to a monastery. But before they do that, they have a big feast and a festival and he gets a lot of photo opportunities. Plus, well, by the looks of the presents that he's got, a packet of Kellogg's cornflakes to take off to the monastery with him. Ah, one of the home comforts, I guess. As you can see, Inlay Lake has become very popular with tourists from all over the region. One can only assume that uh, the traffic isn't going to get any better. It is one of the sad things about travel. One wants to encourage people to go to places and see for themselves what is really going on in the world, and at the same time one is slowly destroying the very thing that one is there to see. The Shui Indian Pagodas were, so local people believed, commissioned by King Ashoka, the founder of a great Indian Buddhist empire, though nobody knows if this is true. What they do know is that they date from the time when King John, back in ye olde England, was having so much trouble with those pesky barons. All the stupas are dedicated to particular Buddhas and monks, and are sponsored by various important families. I'm sure stupomania was the equivalent to our modern obsession with Facebook, and that mothers all over Burma in the 13th century were muttering such things as, ooh, there's just all this to do around the house and all you can think about is building another pile of bricks. The Phuang Do U Pagoda is the most highly revered monastery in the Inlay area, as it houses five ancient images of the Buddha. These statues are thought to be more than 800 years old, but are now unrecognizable as Buddhas because of the amount of gold covering them. Revered though they are, they did manage to drop one in the lake when they were taking them all on a ceremonial boat ride. Luckily, or miraculously, it managed to be washed up back near the monastery, and now they never let it leave. The obelisk marks the spot. The years of isolation built up a very self-reliant culture. All the villagers seem to have various cottage industries. Um, 
leave it uh, for five hours. Uh, flour, rice flour, and cassava flour. So. <laughs> <laughs> this village specialised in donuts and rock. My birthplace of Bridlington made rock like this, except a machine did the hard work and they made sure that the name Bridlington was all the way through the suite. I almost suggested they should do it here and corner the market in souvenir snacks. But I feared that my suggestion might not cut through the haze of betel nut buzz. These two had been working 12 hours already trying to produce enough to fulfil the daily quota they needed to get paid. You can see here what I meant by the children's stint in a monastery being uh, more of a summer camp experience than anything terribly religious. We're coming to the end of our trip now and I'd like to point out what a happy life their dogs lead. They get to do as they please, the monks make sure they are fed well and as a result they are very friendly. We flew back to Yangon, had a brief visit to one of the local markets, jewellery textiles and paintings seemed to be the mainstay of this one and that was the end of the journey. Myanmar has not been discovered by all the international brands as yet. How long before McDonald's and Versace turns up I can't say but one does sympathise with those generals who wanted to keep it all to themselves. <laughs>